Um, my name is Sonia Yorg, and I'm honored to welcome everyone um, on behalf of the Virginia Foundation of the Humanities who produced the Virginia Festival of the Book. Um, I want to give a special welcome to the sixth grade class of the Charlottesville Day School who are here in numbers. <laughs> Um, a little housekeeping before we begin. Can you please remember to uh, silence your cell phones? Of course, that won't prevent you from um, sending out tweets. Um, and the hashtag is VA Book 2017. Um, I have been also asked to thank the city of Charlottesville for providing the venue for today's event and for broadcasting this program on Charlottesville's own TV 10. Um, when we get to the Q&A portion, which will be after each of our authors has spoken, um, we ask that you please wait for a microphone to be brought to you if you have a question so that you will be recorded. Thank you. Um, the festival is free of charge but not free of cost. Um, please remember to go online to make a donation or you can pick up an envelope at the Omni Hotel in the lobby. Um, your support ensures that our festival will continue to be here in years to come. Um, you should also have a green evaluation slip. Those are very important. They do look at them. <laughs> they read them. They tabulate what you have to say. You have an opportunity to um, offer your suggestions for authors that you would like to see um, included in the festival in the future. So please don't hesitate to put down your favorites. You can also fill out um, the evaluation form online, vabook.org slash survey. Um, authors do like to sell books. <laughs> so um, please think about buying uh, the books from our festival authors and our local booksellers. Um, and this, of course, shows your support for them. Um, our three authors will be available for book signings after the program is finished. Okay, so today the program is Animal Lives, Genius, Feral, and Cannibal. We'll be discussing the evolutionary and natural history of animals and their exceptional behaviors. So I'm going to int introduce all three speakers to begin with, and then they will each um, talk for a little while, and uh, we'll chat here on the panel with them, and then after all three are over, then we'll open the floor for your, for your questions, and I know you'll have a lot of them. So our first speaker will be Jennifer Ackerman, who's the author of The Genius of Birds, which the Wall Street Journal called a gloriously provocative and highly entertaining book. I've read it and they're right. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> Jennifer has been writing about science, nature, and biology for almost three decades and is the recipient of the National End of Endowment of the Arts Literature Fellowship, a Bunting Fellowship, and a grant from the Arthur P. Sloan Foundation. Abraham Gibson is the author of Feral Animals in the American South, An Evolutionary History, a book which is as much about the people and culture as it is about animals. Abe teaches at the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies at Arizona State University. He has published extensively on a variety of topics related to Southern history, environmental history, and the history of science. Bill Shutt is the author of Cannibalism, A Perfectly Natural History. From the cover, we might conclude that it's a frog-eat-frog -frog world. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard that before, Bill. <laughs> Bill is a biology professor at Long Island University, a research associate in residence at the American Museum of Natural History, and a recipient of that museum's Theodore Roosevelt grant. I love his Twitter handle, Draculi. <laughs> we'll start with Jennifer. Thank you, Sonia. Um, so as Sonia mentioned, I've been writing about science and nature for about 30 years, and I've written about uh, whales and dragonflies, oceans, the human body, microbes, but this book on the intelligence of birds was really a high point for me. Um, first about the, uh, what I learned about this in, in researching this book was really a revelation. Um, first about the, the uh, surprising brains of birds and their um, astonishing mental abilities but also about the, the nature of intelligence and what we can learn about it by studying how other creatures think. Um, we're in the midst of what I think is a real sea change in the understanding of um, uh, the minds of other animals, and birds are a, a really big piece of that progress. Um, for centuries, we thought that 
the, a bird's behavior was driven solely by instinct and that its brain was so small and s primitive that it was capable of only the, the very simplest mental processes. But really in the last um, couple of decades, we've come to realize that birds are much more intelligent than we ever imagined. Um, with cognitive skills that are really more on par with our primate relatives like chimps and orangutans than their reptilian relatives. So to call someone a bird brain was once an insult and it is no longer. Uh, birds can think logically and they can reason on par with young children. They can solve complex problems, they can multitask, they can count. They can make and use their own tools. They can teach one another new things. Uh, they can understand the basic principles of physics. And they can pass along cultural traditions, whether modes of song or styles of tool making. They remember the past and plan for the future. They eavesdrop. They give gifts. They tease. And they play. So I thought I'd share just a few examples of the really impressive mental skills of birds. Some birds can communicate in ways that resemble human language. Take chickadees. Their calls are considered among the most sophisticated and precise systems of communication of any land animal. So chickadees use their calls to maintain contact with their mates and also to um, uh, announce a nearby food source. But the really interesting language-like calls that they use are to warn of predators. And these calls specify both the type of predator, whether it's arriving by land or by air, and also the degree of threat that that predator represents. So the number of Ds in a chickadee's call indicates a predator's size and hence the degree of threat. So the more Ds you have in the, in the call, the more dangerous the predator. And these calls are to recruit other birds to mob or menace the, the threat. And it's in a, a kind of group defense that's calibrated to the magnitude of the threat. And the chickadee's um, warning calls are so reliable that other species heed them. So the next time you pass a chickadee, note the number of Ds in its call. <laughs> because you might have thought that it was just mindlessly chirping away when it's actually tweeting intelligence to other birds. <laughs> uh, some birds have astonishing memories. Uh, the Clark's Nutcracker is a good example. It's a bird that lives in the high mountains of the West, and it really puts to shame our ability to remember where we put things. <laughs> the Nutcracker caches its food for future use. And it can bury up to 30,000 pine seeds in thousands of locations over dozens of square miles. And remember where it put its own caches months later. Even though the landscape may have dramatically changed with snow, leaves, shifting rocks, and soil. And so the birds seem to do this um, by, they, they actually will go straight to their individual caches, and they, and they seem to do this by taking bearings between multiple landmarks. So for instance, they might uh, register uh, a tall group of trees, a group of rocks, and a hedge. And they use those three um, landmarks to then locate their individual stashes. But imagine remembering thousands of such locations. Even pigeons have truly remarkable memories. They can learn and recall hundreds of pictures and store them in long-term memory for as long as a year. Um, I grew very fond of pigeons uh, during this book. The expression, you pigeon brain, could even be considered something of a compliment. So pigeons are not capable of um, complex communication or um, difficult problem solving, but they're great learners and they're extremely gifted at making visual distinctions. So they're capable of distinguishing between different letters in um, the alphabet, between different human faces, and even paintings of different artistic styles. So in fact, pigeons can correctly categorize a painting they've never seen before 
putting a Renoir in the Impressionist category and a Brock in with the cu Cubists. And of course, they're also extraordinary navigators. Um, and among the Einsteins in the bird world is the African gray parrot. Um, beginning in the 1970s, the, the very charming and cunning African gray parrot named Alex partnered with Harvard scientist Irene Pepperberg um, to show the world that some birds appear to have intellectual abilities that rival primates and for really forever changing our view of the avian brain. Alex could grasp the meaning of hundreds of words and use them in a meaningful way himself. He could understand abstract ideas like the concept of zero. He knew his colors and shapes and numbers and materials. He could do basic math. So you could ask him how many green objects are on this table full of colorful objects, and Alex would reply four or six or eight. And if you asked him what an object was made of, he would feel it with his beak and tongue, and he could answer correctly, wood. So this is something that goes way beyond mere mimicry or imitation. But these birds are also very good at that. <laughs> uh, there's a book in, uh, bird in my book named uh, Throckmorton, who's an African and gray parrot, and he belongs to a couple here in Charlottesville named Bob and Karen. And Throckmorton loves to tease Bob and Karen. He can mimic their voices so accurately that, that <laughs> they themselves don't know whether they're being hailed by their bird or their spouse. <laughs> and he can also mimic the different rings of their cell phones. <laughs> so one of his favorite ploys is to summon Bob from the garage by imitating his cell ring. And then Bob comes running in, drops everything, comes running in to answer the phone, and Throckmorton answers it for him. He says, Hello? Uh-huh. 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 And then he finishes with this flat ringtone of hanging up. Wow. So Frock Morton seems to enjoy this game quite a lot, but uh, Bob not so much. So birds do all of this with a packet of brains so tiny that it would, it would fit easily inside an almond or a walnut. And how can this be? Um, well, we've known for some time that, bird, that, that brain size is not the sole or even the main indicator of intelligence. And the truth is that some species of birds have brains that are very large for their body size, just as we humans do. It's called relative brain size. And while the brains of birds may be small overall, it turns out that they're densely packed with brain cells or neurons. In fact, uh, Parrots and corvids like crows, jays, and ravens have twice as many neurons in their brains as um, primates of the same size and mammals, uh, and four times as many as mammal brains of the same size. And these neurons are connected in um, very complex pathways that are similar to our own. So I traveled to many places for this book and spoke with a lot of researchers from all over the world, but the highlight of my trip was, um, a highlight of my travel was a trip to the home of what is arguably the world's smartest bird. It's, uh, on a tiny remote island in the Southwest Pacific lives the New Caledonian Crow. And this bird is really remarkable for its extremely um, adept problem-solving abilities and for its capacity to make and use its own tools, complex tools really on par with chimps and orangutans. In fact, New Caledonian crows are the only species other than humans to make what are called hook tools, which is a, a stick with a little hook on the end of it, and they use it to grab grubs out of, the, of holes in trees. And the crows will sometimes keep a favorite tool and carry it from place to place, and they'll hold it under their foot um, so they don't lose it while they're eating their, uh, their grub. And here's what's really cool. The birds seem to have different styles of tool making in different parts of the island, and they, which they pass down over generations. So that the faithful transmission of tool design, that's a really good definition of culture. Okay, and one quick final example of bird genius. Um, not far from New Caledonia in Australia and New Guinea 
lives an extraordinary family of birds renowned for a different sort of intelligence. Um, it's an apparent sense of beauty or aesthetics. These are bower birds. And male bower birds build special bowers to woo their f females. And these are little archways or other structures made of sticks and they're adorned with colorful or shiny objects. Um, and these are not nests. There's no raising of young that takes place here. They are settings for seduction. <laughs> and each species of bowerbird has its preferred ornaments, which are carefully selected to draw in the female. Spotted bowerbirds, for instance, like shiny things. So they decorate their bowers with shiny beetle shells, coins, jewelry, glass, nails. In one bower, the bird had put all the shiny new nails in the front of his bower and the oxidized ones in the back. <laughs> so he is sorting the nice ones from the not so nice ones. And another spotted bird, a bower bird built his bower near the house of a stained glass artist. And it was filled with little shards of stained glass that he had sorted by color and laid out the pieces just like a mosaic. So birds have really taught us there's more than one way to wire a clever brain. And the genius of birds uh, explores the ambitious science going on everywhere in bird intelligence research to try to understand the mysteries of the bird mind. It features the, the Einsteins of the bird world, like parrots and corvids and bowerbirds, but also the less celebrated but still surprisingly bright species around us, the titmice, jays, and sparrows. So after reading this book, I hope that people will um, come to see birds differently, really as the clever, creative, and innovative creatures they are. And also to question what intelligence is and whether there might be kinds of genius in the natural world that are beyond our ways of knowing. Thank you. So I have um, one question yes. for you, Jennifer, uh -huh. before we move on. Um, I was lucky enough just to spend um, some time in New Zealand with my husband, and we did a lot of um, hiking and backpacking. And we encountered um, the world's only mm -hmm. alpine parrot that I know that you're familiar with, the bird called a kia. And um, it's really a very cheeky bird. Um, you can approach them quite near and they're, they're very comical. But we also heard stories from other backpackers about Kias um, committing vandalism um, and ripping open tents at night and pulling things from tents. Now some of this was foraging behavior. They were after food. But they um, seemed to go beyond that. In one case, somebody, they pulled out a can of tuna and just dragged it down to the river and dumped it in. <laughs> and, and in another case, you know, grabbed a pair of sunglasses and just made off with them. Um, and um, I, I've also had the feeling from um, watching crows that sometimes it's almost like they have too much time on their hands. <laughs> and um, that <laughs> I, so I just wondered if you might comment on the, you know, the generally about the parrot family, which you've talked about a little bit, but also the idea that um, anim, uh, birds being so smart that they have time for mischief. Yes. They, well, the kias are one of my favorite birds, and they're very playful. I mean, they will play with each other. They roughhouse, and they, I mean, they roll around together, jump on each other's stomachs. They, and this is, there's no real purpose to this activity. It is just play. Um, they are also uh, tremendously clever and, um, yes, destructive. They're, they're, um, uh, they're not very popular with the um, uh, sheep herders in New Zealand because they figured out that the sheep that, the, that were brought in were actually a wonderful source of meat. All you had to do was sit on their backs and peck. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> did not make the sheep or their, uh, their herders happy. And um, they are, they're just mischievous. They're, uh, in the book I tell a story about a, um, uh, <laughs> an unfortunate tourist who was in a camper and he um, pulled up to a pass in the mountains and he saw this really interesting green bird on the ground near him and he got out of his camper and went to look at it. His, the windows in his camper were down. And uh, 
the bird flew away from him, flew into the camper, and grabbed his bag of pound notes from the, <laughs> the dashboard and flew off with it. And it was his, it was his all of his money for the, the, the entire trip. And he said, now he's, that key is probably lining his nest with my uh, thousand pound notes <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> So yeah, they're um, they're very and and I think the uh, the idea that that some birds are playful is is very interesting and there is you know documented especially on YouTube now um, instances of behavior of that just is playful. Um, there's a there's one a, a YouTube of a crow in Russia that sliding down a roof that's lined with snow on a little bottle cap and he he just at the bottom. <laughs> He picks it up and he goes to the top again and he just keeps doing it. Um, not, not much. <laughs> That's wonderful. So, yeah. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Okay, so now we're going to leave the bird world and, um, and hear from Abe Gibson. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thanks to my fellow co panelists, to everyone here. This is, um, this is a great experience for me. It's actually a real bucket list uh, experience for me. I was born and raised here in Virginia. I uh, was an English major not too far away, uh, James Madison a million years ago. Um, and it, I want to also point out that I wouldn't be here at all had my high school librarian, Eric Lawson, not suggested that I uh, apply. And he's actually here in attendance, so thank you very much. I wouldn't be here without you, so thank you. Um, and it's also a great opportunity for me to tell the students that if you're really lucky and you have really great teachers, they'll continue to improve your lives <laughs> 20 years after the fact. So thank you again. I really appreciate it. Um, so the origin of this project began as my dissertation. I'm a historian at Arizona State. And uh, the, the question that originally motivated me, well, I should mention, as a historian, the historical record, of course, is replete with uh, animals, uh, domestic animals. and and yet my life is not really. I look around and I don't see domestic animals all that often, dogs and cats accepted. Well, I'll say more about that later. And so the question for me that motivated this project at the very beginning was where did all the animals go? Well, uh, I knew I wanted to focus on the American South because uh, uh, I'm from the American South. I mentioned I'm from Virginia. I did my graduate work at, uh, in Florida. And as I looked at the historical record, what I quickly discovered is that there, it's not easy to distinguish what an animal is. That is to say whether it's wild or domestic. We think we know what wild animals are, li uh, lions, zebras, etc. And we think we know what domestic animals are, dogs, pigs, horses, etc. But when you look at the historical record, it becomes clear very quickly that some animals uh, blur those boundaries. So. Uh, that's when I learned what a feral animal is. It has a couple different definitions. Uh, for a lot of people it means savage, ferocious, that sort of thing. The definition that, uh, that I use in this book uh, is that a domestic animal, excuse me, a feral animal is any domestic animal who has left domesticity and now lives in the wild. Um, I should also mention, you may have noticed I just referred to animals as who. That is a uh, choice I have made and I've butted heads with a lot of editors uh, for that reason, but I stand by it, so uh, I can explain that later if you like. Um, I guess I should first also, so I've explained the title, the subtitle is fairly important as well. It's called An Evolutionary History, and uh, that's not something that I came up with. It was actually a professor here at University of Virginia uh, named Edmund Russell. He's since uh, moved elsewhere, but his, the idea of evolutionary history, uh, the word evolution scares a lot of people off, but all he means by it and all I mean by it is that we as humans influence the evolution, the gene pools of other species, and that that human-induced evolution in turn influences human culture. So um, that's what I mean by that. That's what I was interested in pursuing. Um, I, to, how does one chart the evolutionary history of these various species. Uh, I decided to look at three different variables. Um, geographic distribution, so where are uh, these animals now? The genetic composition, so what explains why a certain population looks a certain way? And then third, the extent to which they engage with humans. Uh, I should also mention uh, that I look at three species in the book, uh, dogs, horses, and pigs. 
And I chose those because they occupy very different niches. They uh, have each played very important roles in human history and Southern history for that matter. Um, yeah, so uh, ultimately what I ended up doing was trying to retell Southern history from the perspective of non-human animals. Uh, well, but first, if it's going to be an evolutionary history, you have to say where these animals came from in the first place. So the first chapter is, begins, despite the fact this is a book about Southern history, the book begins 200,000 years ago in Africa, because among my four species, if you count humans as a species, and you should, uh, they were the first. So we begin, this narrative begins there, and then uh, subsequently introduce the dogs, pigs, and horses in that order. We tend to think of domestic animals as uh, perhaps being some, uh, having all been domesticated at the same time. That's not true. Dogs were domesticated thousands of years, even before any plants. Dogs were the first domesticated species of any kind back when we were all hunter-gatherers. Then pigs, and most recently horses, as recently as 5,000 years ago. Then subsequently I have to get these animals to the south, and that's interesting because they're, none of the four characters, none of the four species are native to North America, so I have to explain that. Uh, humans and dogs were the first to arrive about 15,000 years ago. They came over the Bering Land Bridge uh, and had their run of the land for, uh, for about 15,000 years or so. And then, uh, as many of you already know, 1492, uh, Christopher Columbus brought... Uh, well, 1493, actually, is when he brought all of uh, the domestic species with which we're familiar now. So they're the only domestic animal in North America prior to uh, the arrival of Europeans was dogs. Um, so, or were dogs, I sh should say. And then, of course, they were joined by more people, more dogs, and horses and pigs. Um, those of you who might, I don't know if any of us, you have, if I have any fellow historians here, but uh, there's a book called Creatures of Empire by Virginia Dijon Anderson. It's a great book. It explains the very significant role that animals played in the colonization efforts, uh, especially in uh, eastern North America. Uh, but whereas her story ends in 1700 and extends no farther south than the Chesapeake, uh, my book looks at the entire south right up to the present. So what I discovered for the colonial period, for example, is that the same pattern is repeated. When colonists arrived, they found it much more time and cost effective to let animals run around and do as they pleased to have the run of the land, and that it was more efficient to fence in crops and r rather than fence in animals. And so that's where the origin of all these feral animals come from. And in subsequent chapters, I explain that uh, the populations cleave. Some animals are brought into domestication. Uh, some remain feral and, and on the open range, if you will, and that things change uh, over time. So that uh, the, the open range, we think of it as being something out west, but there was an open range here in the south for the longest time, and the range closed at different times for different species. So uh, horses, of course, are very valuable. Uh, they were the first ones to be brought in off the range. Uh, ultimately, around the late 1800s, early 1900s, domestic, or excuse me, feral pigs were deemed too invasive. Uh, that's, not a, that's a 20th century label. They wouldn't have been called that at the time. And so the range ultimately closed for them as well. That is to say, they were no longer allowed to roam free with uh, unencumbered. Um, and I, I make the argument that the range has also closed on dogs more recently. Uh, so I mentioned that the story comes all the way up to the present. And, uh, and I should also mention that it's not just about feral animals, it's about domestic and feral animals and the extent to which these populations become distinct and are kept distinct over time, uh, such that now, for example, in the United States, there are something on the order of 60 million pigs, uh, domestic pigs, I should mention, all of them, the vast majority of them, are located in industrial processing facilities. Um, uh, there, for, by comparison's sake, there's about six million feral pigs. Uh, so these are free-ranging pigs that are um, deemed invasive species. I'll be happy to explain why they're there and what they're doing and that sort of thing. They are absolutely, they're actually in about 40 states now, 45 states, so uh, feral pigs are not going anywhere. Um, in fact, their numbers have doubled in the past 20 years, and I'll be happy to say more about that in a minute. But for the time being, 
Uh, yes, feral pigs are absolutely concentrated here in the southeast, and there are a lot of social cultural reasons for that. Horses, uh, the population of horses in the United States were the, the uh, they were at their highest or at their peak right around 1920, uh, and at that point, the automobile had been around for a while, and people were somewhat uh, optimistic, I should say, that, that the horse would always remain in high numbers, but that wasn't true. Their numbers started to plummet soon thereafter. Uh, in fact, the USDA conducts an agricultural census every five years, and they count about four or five million horses now, although they also don't put a whole lot of effort into counting horses, so it's not exactly clear. Um, there are thousands, tens of thousands of feral horses out west. You've all heard of the Mustangs. Those are feral horses. They're not wild horses. I have made a career of correcting people who refer to <laughs> wild, the wild Mustangs. They're technically feral, I'm obliged to point out. They are uh, descended from horses that escaped from Spanish missions in the southwest. Uh, you may be wondering about the feral horses in the uh, Southeast, where are they? Well, here in Virginia, for example, Assateague, Shink well, they're all in Assateague now. You've probably heard of Misty of Shinkateague. Uh, those are technically feral horses, and as much as they live and reproduce of their own accord, they are, their geographic range is generally not restricted. Um, and so, yes, there's about a couple hundred feral horses uh, in the Southeast. As for dogs, there are something on the order of 70 million uh, pets, so where there's very popular uh, pet, as you can imagine. And when I say that the range has closed on dogs, what I mean is that, so I grew up in a very rural area, and we had an outside dog, uh, and we always had outside dogs. And when I grew up and started living in cities, I noticed that nobody knows what an outside dog even is anymore. <laughs> and some people thought I was extremely cruel for keeping the dog outside. <laughs> Uh, but it is true that uh, the vast majority of dogs in the United States now live indoors. Among them, a majority actually sleep in the same bed as their <laughs> owner. As is, that's great, because I should also mention that something on the order of 75% of people consider their dog the, a member of the family. So, of course, they should be treated with that kind of respect. Uh, but that also means that the range has closed for them. No long, you no longer see dogs running around in the streets of Charlottesville, for example. They're a bit too conspicuous. So that doesn't mean that there aren't feral dogs, though. Uh, unfortunately, dogs are feralized every single day in every single community. And what I mean is that they are turned loose. They are relinquished. And uh, the bond between human and animal is broken. So there's a lot of debate about when fer ferality begins, when fer the feralization process begins. For me, it begins in that moment when two animals start to drift apart, the human and, in this case, the dog. So if you relinquish a dog to a pound, for example, that is when ferality begins. Uh, and so, for example, there uh, are something on the order of five million dogs euthanized in the United States every single year. That's down from about 20 million a year uh, about just 20, 30 years ago. And you think, well, yeah, that's great that we're of course, it's great that we're euthanizing less dogs, that, um, although it also means less dogs. So from an evolutionary perspective, it's not exactly clear that it's in the best interest of the dog, unless, of course, they're all being adopted, in which case it is. Um, I will say a great deal more, and I have plenty of questions, but I guess that's it. I just, uh, it's hard to cover 200,000 years in <laughs> 10, 15 minutes. Hopefully I've given you some vague idea of where I'm coming from, and so I'll yield the rest of my time. Thanks, Abe. Sure. Um, I just um, I will launch one question at yes, you, if means. that's okay. Um, so you, you said that the outlook for feral horses is promising, mostly um, because, and this is in your book, sure. uh, mostly because people like looking at them and want to protect them. Right. Um, horses, or we romanticize horses. Um, after all, no one's going to show up for the running of the pigs at Shin Shinkatique. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, so, but I guess my, my question really is, how much do considerations like this factor into decisions about how we, as a, as a culture, um, deal with feral animals? 
Quite a bit. So uh, you're right, there's the annual pony swim. Uh, for those of you who've never been to uh, Estique or Chincoteague, it's quite a, uh, an experience. Uh, but, and there's, of course, the origin story. If you go to the Chincoteague Wildlife Center, it's uh, there on Chincoteague, you'll see a huge mural um, depicting the fabled origin of these Assateague horses. And I say, I see, keep going back between Assateague and Chincoteague. All of the feral horses are now on Assateague and they're swam over to Chincoteague for the annual pinning. Um, and this myth, and I, unfortunately I think it is a myth, it hasn't been proven, uh, and even if it was true, it doesn't explain the current population of horses. That's because uh, people have continuously replenished the horses of Assateague with, for example, horses from uh, Mustangs out west, for example. So the Assateague horses would have long since ceased to exist uh, had humans not intervened. And the reason we intervene is really no longer for utilitarian purposes. It's because we want to romanticize them. It's because it's, we want to sell wall calendars and things like that, and that's fine. <laughs> I wrote, I mean, I don't mean to disparage them. I wrote a whole book on them, so I'm a fan. <laughs> but it's also true. I think we should notice that um, there have been no new horses introduced to the Assateague, or the Assateague band since the 70s, but even then that's indication that this is not uh, a, a population of horses that have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. They are constantly replenished in order to maintain, in order to, that they'll be there for future generations, I guess. So I think it, uh, in the case of horses, it factors in a great deal. Okay, thanks. I'm sure, sure we'll have more questions at the end. Sure. Um, Bill Shutt. Hi. Nice to see everybody. I got to start off with a Kia story, and this is uh, <laughs> the, this is that great green parrot in New Zealand. And so my friend and I are tooling around in the mountains, and uh, and and we pull up, and there's a there's an overview where people stop and and look at the beautiful sights, and I, and we pull over, and there's a, and there's a car, and one car, and and outside the car, about 20 feet away, are, are two obviously. Uh, Japanese tourists and they're standing away from the car and I look and there's two Kias on the on the windshield of the car and they're pulling the rubber molding from underneath the window frame around the windshield and they're and they're really going at it and then one's got a big piece out and he's peeling it, the other one's over here trying so I, I kind of like sidle up to the two people and I'm like um, they're eating your car <laughs> And the, and the lady looks at me and she goes, rental car. <laughs> and, the, and the guy says, extra insurance. <laughs> so, yeah. No cannibals in that story. All right, so let's get started on that. They always say the cannibalism guy, you know, it's closer to lunch now. It's more appropriate. <laughs> Um, so, so now with social media, you know, like Facebook and Twitter, I'm here from people that I haven't heard from in like 40 years, and they're like, you, I mean, yeah, what, are you, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, you know, I just wrote a book about cannibalism, and my first book was about blood feeding creatures, <laughs> and, and basically the response is, is, is along the lines of, sounds about right. <laughs> I, so, so I was a kid before, when I was even younger than you guys, I had a monkey. Um, I was into all sorts of strange creatures. So uh, this, these are in the days when you could go to like a department store. I lived on Long Island. I grew up on Long Island. And, um, and, and my, my mother and I are in a department store. No plan to do this. My father's a milkman. He's out working really hard. And, and there's a squirrel monkey for $29.95 <laughs> with, with a parrot cage. And so, make a long story short, my father comes home, it's probably three o'clock in the afternoon, he's completely whipped, and there in the living room on a ca in a cage is a monkey. <laughs> so, so the way my parents were is, is kind of like along the lines of, I instead of getting all freaked out about it, they were like, my father looked at me and he says, well, that, that cage will, won't do, you're going to have to get a better cage than that. <laughs> so build a better cage. So, so I took a... Uh, a I took a, a tape measure and I, I thought, all right, well, I got to go measure something that I can replicate easily because I'm not really a carpenter. So I went down to 7-Eleven and back in those days they had uh, phone booths. So, so I measured a phone booth. So my parents were like, oh, you're building a bigger cage, right? And I was like, yeah. And I went and got all this wood and I started to build this thing. And there in, 
make a short story longer. Uh, in, the, in the middle of my living room was a cage that was the size of a, of a phone booth where, where, where my monkey Googie lived uh, for many years. So, so I've always been into, I guess that, you know, when, when, when the question comes up, you know, how do you write a book about cannibalism or you know, this book about like vampires? Nobody is, is really surprised because I've sort of been in, when I went to graduate school at Cornell, I studied vampire bats. So, um, so and I wrote, and I, I work at the Museum of Natural History, which is really a dream, and, and, um, and, and I was able to, to, to write a, a bunch of papers about these. And I worked with this wonderful artist, Patricia Wynn, who's, uh, who, uh, she's been the artist for all of my books, including the, the fiction that, that just came out, Hell's Gate. Um, and so, so after I cranked out about two dozen papers, and, and, I, and I teach as well, and, and Katie is one of my students who's here, and I, that was a big surprise to me. Um, so um, af after about two dozen papers, I, I, I got the opportunity to, to write a book about, uh, about blood-feeding creatures. And, 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 I, and I wanted to make this a book that was from the, the, the eyes of a zoologist, uh, not to make it sensationalized, but, 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 I'm a, but being a, a, a a professor and a, and a teacher, you also have to be an entertainer, and you and and I wanted to be able to use humor and not throw a lot of jargon around, uh, so, so that it so that you know basically non scientists could enjoy this book. So so the book did did pretty well, and and looking for a follow up for it years later, cannibalism just seems sort of like the natural thing to do. And I'm really afraid thinking, was, to know what's next. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's really funny. I was like, well, I, I said to my wife, I said, I'm thinking of torture. She's like, no torture. I'm not living with you for three years writing a book about torture. But, like, cannibalism is okay, I guess. So, um, all right. All right. So, so what I found was that, well, well, the first book about blood feeding was, uh, the first third of it was pretty much written already because I'd done all of this work on vampire bats. And then I would fill in the blanks with things like bed bugs and all these other fun guys, leeches. Um, but, but when I started to work on cannibalism, the, the learning curve was incredibly steep because, you know, what did I know about cannibalism? So what I found out, to, uh, I looked at this, I, when I looked at the books that were out there, there was all this sensationalistic stuff, extremely gory. You could tell it hadn't been, you know, I don't really consider it to be that well written. Uh, and, and on the other side of it was, uh, were some really highly academic books that were, that were written for specialists that were working in the field on whatever animal they happened to be working on. Uh, and there was nothing in the middle. And, and so, so I was able to sort of step in, first with this blood feeding book and now, and now cannibalism, to, to demystify something that is, uh, you, you know, your knee-jerk reaction when I say cannibalism, you're probably thinking Jeffrey Dahmer or these guys that are stuck up in the Andes and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. And, and what I realized, what I came to realize was that across the animal kingdom, there are thousands of species that, that cannibalize each other for reasons that have nothing to do with there's not enough food or the other, the party line was, by scientists, was this, you know, they run out of food and they eat each other, except for these weirdos, black widows and mantises, and we don't know what they're doing. Um, or, 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 or this cannibalism was because of captive conditions. You stick these guys in a cage and then they act weird and then they eat each other. And, and, and so for the longest time, that's what scientists thought. And what I was able to, to show and to, and to work with the researchers that did this is that cannibalism across nature is there for reasons that, that have nothing to do with that. For example, cannibalism as a form of parental care. Now that, yeah, well, it sounds kind of weird. So spider, there are, there are hundreds of species of spiders and insects and, and snails that produce eggs that are never going to hatch. These are called trophic eggs. And these, hatch, the, these eggs are doled out to the babies um, like they were kids' meals. And so the, the babies feed on these eggs, and then they grow a little bit bigger. In some instances, they, they will eat their mother at a certain point. You know, the female spider will just sort of, after she runs out of trophic eggs, she'll sort of hunker down, and the babies will climb all over her and, and just kind of... Um, they don't really pull her apart. If you can sort of envision sticking straws in her and sort of you know, liquefying her innards and then sort of snorking her up like a uh, spider-flavored Slurpee. Um, so, there, so there were all sorts of cool examples like that. Yeah. Yes, right? 
Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes, um, not a plant, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, so, so it's also used as a, as, so, so there are all these kinds of cool examples, like there are these, the, these legless amphibians called Sicilians. And I always have to clear this up, that's Sicilian with a C, because all my Italian relatives are like, what? <laughs> and I'm, so, and so they're these little worm-like creatures, and what happens is that, is, is that when they hatch from their eggs, the, the skin of the mother gets, is really kind of puffy and fatty, which is kind of weird, and they peel it and eat it. And this is not a- abnormal behavior. This is a highly evolved system. So, uh, so there's all sorts of cool examples like that, parental care. Sharks that are, uh, well, I won't even go into those. These are all gross everybody out here. So, um, but, uh, but, but here's one. So, the, so cannibalism is a hedge against kind of uh, changing environmental conditions. I went to, um, to the Cherokee Mountains in Arizona and worked with, uh, with, with researchers who were working on these cool spade foot toads. And toads, you know, lay eggs and the eggs turn into tadpoles and the tadpoles swim around for a while and eat algae and poop and whatever's there and then they grow legs and they crawl out of the pond. Well, if the pond is going to dry up in a day because it looks like this pond is something that it looks like, when I heard pond I'm like, all right, maybe you know, I can get in there and no, this is like if a car, if a car did a, you know, spun out and then water filled that and, and, th- and then Frogs lay their, these toads lay their eggs in it. Now, if you think about it, if, if that dries out before those eggs go into tadpole and the tadpole crawls out of, onto the land, everybody dies. So what has evolved is this thing where around day three or four, so all of these eggs have hatched and all of these kind of little tadpoles are swimming around, all of a sudden, half of them get huge, huge mouths, big teeth, the intestines shorten up, and they start chomping down on their brethren. These are the same, this is the same brood. And so really what this, and, and they develop quicker, and so in a sense they get out of the pool faster. And so, it, so some of them are gonna survive because of the, and the other guys are just kind of like, they, they are developing slower on this vegetarian diet. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, all right, so, so some of you have been, may have been wondering what this is. And, and, and this is a, an example of, of, of uh, cannibalism that was due to overcrowding that, that uh, was discovered by poultry farmers in the 1940s when they realized that um, they, they started to increase the number of, of chicken. This is, this is not a chicken. This is, a, this is actually a fox. Um, they started to realize... Um, it's, it, they started to realize that they, they, they cranked up the numbers of birds, but the technology was the old technology, and there was a, there was a lot of overcrowding. And pecking order is something that is a reality. It's, these birds are, are pecking on each other, and it really it different. It, it sort of sets up the order of who gets to eat. Um, and, and some of this pecking leads to serious injury and cannibalism, especially when these birds, and this is the 1940s, are crowded thousands of these animals into, into small areas. So, so what the National Band and Tag Company came up with was no peck specs. And these are sunglasses <laughs> that were produced in the thousands that they placed onto the beaks of their birds so that the birds would, so, when, so the birds looking through the, at the world through these rose-colored glasses, and then, and then when, they, when they put their heads down to eat, right, then, then this kind of folds out of the way, and they can see down on the ground, but when they put their heads back up, they're seeing red again. And this kept them from like seeing a bird that was bloody and then pecking at it. And so, so I bought one of, this is a real one, this is from the 1940s. And so they'd sell these thousands of these things uh, to, to poultry farmers. You got to go up in line and, and look at and, and look at this. It'll just look like chicken sunglasses or whatever. You'll be able to find it, and you'll see you'll see th- you'll see thousands of birds in a, in a farmyard, all of them wearing shades. I wonder so, whose job it was to put those on, right? <laughs> it, 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 they took a little pin and stuck it through the. Yeah, I see. Uh, it, it's all fun and games until the farmer brings out the cotter pin. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I wanted this book, when I got to humans, I wanted this book to be about something other than Jeffrey Dahmer and, uh, and, 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 and his ilk. 
Um, and so what I was able to, to, to see was were all these kinds of really cool examples in, 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 of human cannibalism. The most surprising thing was that given the, and, and, and I was also interested in the cannibalism taboo. Why does everybody have the same reaction to the word cannibalism? And, and the, the title of the chapter used to be Blame It on the Greeks. And my editor was like, that's a kind of snarky build. You better back off on that. Um, so now I don't know, what it, whatever it is. No, it's called, called Cannibalism is Bad. Um, and, and, but the take home message is that for, for over 2,000 years now, starting from Homer and then the Romans and then Shakespeare and then the Brothers Grimm and, and, and Daniel Defoe. I used to say, I'd say Willem Defoe and people would. <laughs> uh, so Daniel Defoe is the. Is the Robinson Crusoe guy, Willem Dafoe is the Joker guy, whatever he plays. Um, but, in, but in any event, the take home message over thousands of years has been cannibalism is the worst thing that you can do. So the biggest surprise to me was to find that for hundreds of years in Europe, starting in the Middle Ages through the Renaissance and right up into the 20th century, body parts were used for every body part you can think of, from skulls to bones to fat to every gut except probably your gallbladder because it's got bile in it, was used to treat every sort of disease that you can envision. Uh, and, and the last vestige of that is probably, you know, there are some people who, um, who think that by consuming their placentas after they give birth that they will be able to replenish the hormones that, they, uh, uh, that, that, they've, that, that they've lost. But I mean, th so just sort of to sum up, the, once I got into human cannibalism, you know, I looked at the Donner Party and I said, well, this has got to be something that's been completely worked over. It happened 170 years ago, all these people, and it just wasn't the case. There were all of these breaking news items about, uh, you know, Donner Party didn't cannibalize their, uh, and these are pioneers from, in 1847. Uh, but, but there was all this controversy that they did not, maybe they didn't eat their, their, their friends. And, and in reality, they really did, but it was a mess up by a public relations department of a school who had a researcher working on this. Um, so there were all sorts of incredibly cool stories from, you know, uh, Christopher Columbus using the term cannibalism as a way to uh, dehumanize the people that he, that, that he encountered in the New World. Because you had to treat people nicely if they were, you know, if they, if they were ready to fall in line and, 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 and uh, you know, and, and, and follow your orders, everything was cool. But if they resisted, uh, then, then, they were, then they were labeled as cannibals. And it, it came down from Queen Isabella that cannibalism is all bets are off. You could do whatever you want to these people. Mm -hmm. So it was really used as a, as, a, as, a, as a weapon, in a sense, to go in and, and just hammer these cultures into the sand. So um, I found it kind of interesting to look at cannibalism in ways that, that most people might not think about looking at it. Thanks, Bill. Fascinating. Well, I know you're all chomping at the bit. <coughs> to, sorry. Um, to ask some questions. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Susan. Susan has the microphone if anybody would like to jump in. I think this. Yeah. Hi, uh, this is a question for Mr. Schutt. Uh, so, I'm just curious. Some of the cases of cannibalism you talk in your book are pretty clearly adaptive, thing, like the spadefoot toads that you mentioned, and like a lot of cases of um, children eating children, I guess, yeah. in general. Uh, but um, I was wondering, other cases seem more likely to be exaptations than adaptations, uh, and so I was just wondering, yeah, there are, what kind of the what kind of percentage would you percentages would you give on that from the stuff you've seen? Yeah, you know, very rarely do you find something in nature that doesn't have an ada uh, you know um, adaptive value. They were the probably the two most famous examples um, were these chimpanzees called Passion and Palm that uh, that Jane Goodall studied, and um, and 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 for some reason a a, a mother daughter duo murdered and ate. Uh, probably a, a dozen um, young chimpanzees grabbed them away from their moms and 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 killed them and consumed them and and for the longest time it was you know and that's about as close to aberrant behavior as I can think of in the animal kingdom because most of it there's a reason for it um, but that but that's one that sort of jumps out you know some people thought that it was a f just feeding you know it was getting extra food but but other people were like they, they, there's no real explanation for why that happened. Um, usually when you see that type of cannibalism take place, it's, it's males who are 
doing that to the to to the the babies of of mothers who tr to try to terminate the maternal investment so that they could mate with the um, with them, kind of like lions do that, and bears and and the big cats. Um, Bill, I uh, I wish I'd had you in high school as my teacher. Um, I wanted to mention another book that looks at cannibalism in Africa that's going on today. Oh. Uh, the book is written by a local author, Tara, Tara Sullivan. It's called Golden Boy. It's actually written for junior high school. I mean, uh, yeah, for, for uh, uh, junior high school kids. And it's about the, uh, the concept that if you eat a part of an albino child, oh. it will cure your AIDS. It's pretty yeah, stunning. Yeah, this is really unfortunate. And it's pretty real. Yeah, uh, as you know, the, the um, people who, have, who suffer or, or who exhibit albinism are, um, are persecuted. And, and this, I hadn't heard about the cannibalism, but I'd heard about, um, about killing them. Um, horrible. Uh, thanks. I'd like to check that out. This question is for Ms. Ackerman. As I read your book, uh, I wondered about the researchers and how they gathered some of this information. I know some of it was by observation, but I wondered if euthanization of the birds, and I, as I read, I said, I wonder how many birds gave their lives for this increase in scientific knowledge. And I felt, as a bird lover, I felt kind of sad about this. Yeah. Uh. It's a very good point, and um, I have heard from other readers um, with a similar response. And, it, you know, many of the researchers really minimize their, the toll that they inflict on the birds. They really work very hard at that, and, and there's a, you know, a real effort to capture and release, if, they, if that's at all possible. But those who are studying the anatomy of the bird brain, yes, they are absolutely, um, uh, they're killing birds. Um, they try to focus on birds that, you know, the, of which we have, they're an abundance, um, so they're common species. But nevertheless, it's, a, it's an issue in, in any kind of, of um, cognitive research that you're you know, often euthanizing animals for the, the uh, advancement of science. And it, it, is, it, it is a difficult thing. It's a, a very difficult trade-off. Um, and uh, you know, I think that's true for also keeping um, birds in laboratories, uh, especially parrots, which are social, social species, and you know they do suffer for being withdrawn from their flocks. Um, yeah, so these are these are really important issues, and I'm glad you raised the point. Hi, Miss Ackerman. Uh, I have an interest in extinct birds, uh, in particular Hesperorniforms. Uh, do you know of any paleontological research that's building on the, the work we now have with, you know, extant birds, the intelligence of birds? Oh, it's a really good question. Um, you, you know, the, the evolution of intelligence, it's a, it's a difficult field because you can't observe behavior. You're, you're basically, it's um, extrapolating it's from, Something yeah, from size of brain and um, imagined life history or supposed life history. So I think it's, um, it, I will say that generally the, um, the field of animal cognition is in its infancy, and I think that's especially true for the evolution of cognition, but there's some very interesting work going on. For, uh, for Jennifer, a very specific question. A lot of the bird behavior can be inferred just by observation, but you talked about the bird specifically doing triangulation and memorizing the landmarks. How do they know that? I mean, they can't ask the birds what they're doing, no. and so even by observation, they can't really tell exactly what they're looking at, whether they're using the Earth's magnetic field or other no. cues like that. How do they infer what the birds are actually doing? Well, they, they are doing so in a laboratory setting in some instances, and you know, that is artificial. Um, it's not what they're doing in the natural world, but it does give them an idea of, 
of the information that they're using to um, retrieve their stashes. And again, this is, um, we have not figured this out. They, these are largely theories, um, but we're building on that knowledge. We got a question over here. Yes. Um, this is from Ms. Ackerman. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering in how the, the birds remember where they put their food, like, do they use landmarks? That's the idea, yeah, that they're using um, landmarks that actually, uh, you know, project up out of the snow so that they, they're not buried by thing, by, you know, rocks. tree, yeah, trees or rocks, um, hedges, things that, that uh, project from the landscape. Hi, um, I had a question for Abe about the feral pigs and if you could talk a little bit about the invasive nature of them, where, where they are, are they in Virginia, are they heading this way? Um, where? <laughs> I think we wanna know. Duck. Yeah. Are they cannibalistic? Uh, well, sadly they are, so that's the thing, yes. You've been warned. Um, so it's the craziest thing, they've been around, uh, the, the guess is that for the past several centuries there's been about a million feral pigs and in the 1990s um, uh, biologists decided that there were about two and a half million feral pigs almost exclusively in the southeast and riverine shallows and those kind of places uh, and so this was in the 1990s and biologists uh, appealed to hunters and said uh, if you can help us eradicate this invasive species it would be really great 20 years later, they have doubled, and they're now, instead of 20 states, they're in something like 40 or 45. And what's happening is hunters are translocating these pigs so that they can be closer to, so they can be closer to them, closer to their hunting quarry. So, uh, in effect, what has happened is uh, these, they're being transplanted so that they could be hunted and killed. As a result, we now have something like six million pigs. Yes, we do have them in Virginia. You may have seen within the past month, in fact, there was a hogzilla that was killed in Culpeper, not too far from here. You may have seen the image. It was on the front page of CNN.com. And again, this, and so I answered, yes, they are coming, but it's not because they're overrunning all of us. It's because they're being translocated by people for deliberate purposes. And uh, they're not going anywhere. They're, there's a lot of them. And, um, and uh, they're in every county in Florida, for example. Uh, Texas itself has something like two million. So uh, yes, there's quite a bit. Uh, in Virginia, they're mostly in the southeast in the coastal regions. Uh, my question is for Mr. Gibson. Yes. So you said that you corrected people on saying wild horses because they were technically feral. Is there a difference between wild and feral? So uh, the way I use it and the way a lot of biologists use it, uh, wild means never domesticated, whereas feral means that either that animal was his or herself once domesticated or had domesticated ancestors. So that's why I said the Mustangs, they, uh, the, uh, they were descended from domestic animals. Now they roam free, that's why they're technically known as feral. There is, uh, by all accounts, one population of truly wild horses left in the world, the Shavalsky horses in uh, Mongolia. And you can actually see one in the uh, National Zoo, or a couple of them in the National Zoo in D.C. Now, whether a, a, an animal in captivity still qualifies as wild, I don't know. But that's the definition I use, and uh, I base that on biologists. So that's a very good question. Uh, this question's for Abe. I'm curious, uh, with the feral pigs, would they be less fatty than a <laughs> domesticated pig? And with all the emphasis on bacon and ham and things like that these days, I'm just curious about the, uh, yeah. whether they would be less fatty and then not as editable, edible. Or sure. No, absolutely. Great question. Um, especially since a lot of people have suggested that we could just eat them and they would get be done with that way. Uh, yes, to answer your question, absolutely. Um, in the antebellum period, pigs in Chicago, for example, were twice as heavy. They were on something on the order of 300 pounds, while pigs in the south were about 150. So it's dramatically different because, one, they're not getting fed in a sty, so 
that means they're not getting as many calories and also they have to forage uh, about for their food so they're burning a lot of calories the razorback nickname comes from the that you could see the spine protruding essentially because they don't have fat they're not the fat pink pigs that we're all familiar with they're mean looking and hairy and they grow horns and Ferality actually affects their morphology, that is to say their shape and look in dramatic ways, especially their weight, yes. Now, I mentioned, though, just very briefly, that uh, there are now reports of hogzillas and things like that. That's also a deliberate thing. So, all of the pigs in the United States uh, were either domestic or feral. Up until the 20th century, when hunters started importing, excuse me, importing wild pigs that were much bigger, uh, would allow for a much bigger trophy. That's what people are interested in. They want to kill a bigger animal. It's more impressive. So now uh, all of the free-ranging pigs uh, in the United States are either, well, actually, they're almost all hybridized between feral and wild. So the feral pigs today are dramatically bigger than they would have been 50 years ago. So uh, they're still foraging, but uh, now they have purposefully been cultivated to be bigger. So. But are they originally all the same? Are they all Seuss scrofa? Are they all the same? They're all, yeah. yes, all the same species. Wild, domestic, and feral. They can all interbreed, so they're all mm. Seuss scrofa, yes. You might have just answered my question, which was going to be my husband is from Berlin. We lived there for a long time. It's a city of three and a half million people. You wouldn't believe it, but there are wild boars and wild pigs in Berlin. It's a big problem. We once had one in our backyard that was about a meter high. I didn't see it. I heard it. It roared like a lion. It scared the living daylights out of me. I jumped back on my balcony. So the question again is, so these are not the wild pigs you're talking about. These are, sorry, the feral pigs. Yeah. They are the hairy kind, you know, the kind that we have in Berlin where the, the women, are, the, the female are knee high, but they are dangerous because they're protecting the young. The male are very high and they, they we just call them boars, wild sure, boars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is what it is. Sorry. Yes, uh, right, and the, in fact the boars, I, I also refer to the wild variety as boars, and the ones that were brought to the United States were brought from the Black Forest, uh, from Germany, that pl and yes, they are considerably bigger, they, are, uh, they look a lot different, as you indicated, but yes, that's where they're from, precisely. Uh, it looks like we've run out of time. Um, thank you so much. Let's thank our panel. Thank you.